to the Kent Lap Podcast. So you do, you have worked with a lot of successful artists. Um, the, I don't know I don't, if you could, you know, name, a, I don't know, n- name a few or, or whatever you're comfortable with, but I have two questions on that. One is, uh, I'm curious what the successful, what are some of the common denominators among the successful artists that, um, and then I'm also curious, what goes on in an artist's brain that a more non-artist person like myself. I, I'm 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 fascinated, but I just don't have that <laughs> I don't have that that part of the brain that, that a lot of those people have yeah. is less active with me for sure. Yeah. But what are some of the common denominators among the successful artists? Well let's start with creative people, um, because some of the most creative people are actually behind the artists and you don't get to see them. So producers and um Let's stay with producers because I I got a number of friends who are producers and songwriters and and I want they're not the guys on the stage you might not even know their names but that's where a lot of the magic happens and most of them they fit we're back to this concept of divergence they're divergent thinkers they're very open and they're creative so they um, the law of improv so I used to do improv comedy when I was in college and stuff like that so the law of improv is whenever somebody like throws you a line you don't you never there's never a no. You never, somebody's like, oh my gosh, it's a purple couch. And you don't go, no, it's not. Like that's like, you yeah. can't, you can't do that. Yep. I got nothing yep. to do, right? Yep. <laughs> that's a purple couch. It is. It looks a lot more like an elephant to me. You know, like you, you, it, the mm. law of improv is you mm-hmm. catch it and you toss it back. Yes. Which this is, by the way, the law of improv is pretty good in relationships. I sometimes use this as an analogy in relationships. Hey, when you're talking, you're, you're spitballing with your wife. She may not know you're spitballing. Yep. You're like, hey, I, I, hey, I was thinking the other day. And she might go, thinking the other day means you came to a conclusion, you're going to tell me this is what we have to do as a family, and now I'm defensive. Right. As opposed to, hey, I got this idea. I'd love to bring you in on it. Let's brainstorm together. Mm -hmm. That's a different conversation. Yep. Because now you've invited improv. Hey, what about this? Well, I don't know. What about this? As opposed to, I was was thinking the other day we should um, spend our money on da-da-da. Yes. What? Yeah. How are we going to spend our money on that? Where are we going to get it from? This is not improvisation. Okay. So I think when you creative people tend to be really good at improv, like, hey, what do you think about this? I don't know. What about that? And then they draw from these kind of, it's cross training. They draw from these other references. Uh, So some might be athletes. And so they're pulling in like athletic metaphor. They had a military brain. They're pulling in a military metaphor. They're a literature background. They're pulling in these ancient stories or referencing Shakespeare, or they, they might be a a movie nut and there's a star Wars thing, but they're, they're constantly pulling in these kind of, there's this divergence of thought. Now what tends to be hard for them again to catalyze around, around an identity is most creatives are not rainmakers. Hmm. They don't know how to make money. So you've got to have the other person like, yes, here's the deadline. It has to be done. And we're going to commodify it this way. Because your typical creator is like, it's actually never done. Mm-hmm. There's always another. If it's a live show, it can be like this. If I'm making a track, it could always be like this. Um, I recently read the life work of Leonardo da Vinci. Like he's the quintessential example of that, right? Also someone who was insatiably curious, but he couldn't, he, to finish something, he was just, he, half of his great works were never finished because he couldn't finish them. He procrastinated, you know, that's very, very creative. That's very, there is, there's no linearity with creatives. It's mm-hmm. not, a, it's mm-hmm. not linear. So it's, which means what it's going to feel like there's a lot of wasted time. So if you have a creative child, you're like, oh my gosh, he's been staring at the wall for 20 minutes. Or, you know, like, again, I'll quote Leonardo. He went to somebody, one of his patrons, like, how come this isn't done yet? You, you ran in here, you did three brush strokes, and then you stood there for an hour and you walked out. Mm-hmm. Well, that, this is not efficient. Creativity is not efficient. And Leonardo looks at him and he says, you have no idea how much work is being done while I'm standing there silent. It's not efficient. Mm-hmm. So the one thing I would just say for if you've but got it's a, beautiful, if you have a creative in your life, yeah, they're not <laughs> going to be really efficient. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and that's where the art comes from, right? Yeah. And it's why we, why they do, by the way, most creatives desperately need then somebody alongside them. 
I'll tell you, uh, this is an, a parenting failure on my part, and 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 Tyler fits it. T- Tyler's unusual. My second son by a minute um, uh, fits this unusual because he's kind of creative and he also is highly organized, but he has ADHD. One of the things we did poorly as parents was well, he wasn't really diagnosed till after high school, so he was high functioning, did really well in his grades and stuff like that. But I mean, he would get up literally. This is not exaggerating. Five months before the five minutes before the bus would get there. And somehow he'd make it. And his brother had to carry some of what we've had to work through is his brother sometimes carried him because mm. he had a twin brother. And Jordan's an empath, so too much. Yep. So there's a story there. But one of the things we did is we often just expected him to fit our normal. And it was not helpful to him. So we've had to come back and go, we, we actually, hey, if we said this to Tyler, would you pick up that coffee pot, bring it over here, pour me a glass of water and put it back? He, he, he might make it around the table to the coffee pot. After that, it's a crapshoot. Oh, wow. Mm-hmm. Even as an adult. Even, and we're in high school. Even now, yes. And even now, there's so many things happening in his mind at one time. And he see, he, if he went over to the coffee shop, he, he goes over to get your coffee pot, and he sees there's like a, some little like herbal thing there. Yeah. He's like, what is that? Is that? Can I smell that? I mean, gone, yep, right? Yep, yep. His mind, he, part of it is the insatiable curiosity. Like, mm-hmm. what is that? Mm-hmm. And we would be like, oh my gosh, he just asked you for a stinking glass of water. Bring it over here. And he's full of wonder. It's actually quite childlike and beautiful. And I actually, in my core, deepest place, I want to be like him. Mm-hmm. But my efficiency and my, I got, I want, man, I want to make sure I'm doing the job Kent wants for me. I, uh, Andrew's over there. I, I, and I'm kind of thirsty. And, all that would suddenly trump the thing that I actually hold valuable more than any other thing is that A, I would like to be like my son and have that kind of curiosity and wonder, mm-hmm. and B, this is my child being really present. And I shut him down. Okay, yes. Because my efficiency or approval for the people in the room was more important. Yes. And that happens to creatives all the time. Hmm. We're frustrated with them because they don't do it right. Yeah. 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 We want the output from the creatives. We don't want to get caught up in the messiness of the production of the creation of that. Because let's just face it. I mean, without creatives, we're, we're screwed. I mean, like they, there's just, there are prophets, there are poets. Yeah. They help us see the deeper things of life. Yes, absolutely. Um, I don't want to put you on the spot, but I'm curious, have you, have you tried Adderall with your son who has ADHD? Um, so we heard so many negative things on Adderall that um, we started with Vivance. Okay. And it was really, really helpful. Oh, wonderful. Yeah. If, the beauty with Vivance is you can take it or not take it. So oh, okay. you take it, at, like you take it in the morning, and it's like a one day deal and boom, you're done. I see. And so, yeah, he would say, I mean, it was all the stuff floating around like, Phew. Wow. And a funny story is when Tyler was being diagnosed, I'm like, he was really having trouble. So I took him into the doctor's office. He's being diagnosed. And I, there was a sheet, you know, the doctor walked out and Tyler was doing something. And there was a sheet on the table that had like a test for ADD, <laughs> which I was like, hmm. So the doctor walked in. I was like, hey, I just kind of took this while I was sitting here. He's like, oh, congratulations. You're like three for four. Yeah, you're a home run ADD candidate. I'm like, great. Everybody's always told me that. And now it's official. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, I actually, I went through a hard season in 2016. We had a lot of loss, a big transition in our church, a lot of expectations and stuff. And I, and I tried Vivance too. And man, it, oh, yeah? it was magical. I didn't do it very long, but it oh, was, really? but it, man, the ability, what it lets you do in terms of focus was awesome. Is it prescription? Yeah. Okay. So I just watched a, two nights ago, I think it was, or three, watched a doc documentary on Netflix called, I can't remember what, but it was all about Adderall use in college for college kids. Five ants, same thing. Okay. Well, man. They use it to cram for tests. And by the time I was done with that documentary, I can't, the the documentary, it's both, um, it's both like speaking positively about Adderall and some of those, what, Ritalin, some of those, some of those drugs that have a helpful effect. And then it also talks about the side benefits. So it's not like the documentary is like, kind of picking a side, if you mm-hmm. will. 
But uh, man, there were some benefits in there on taking um, Ritalin that I was like, man, maybe I should try to get some Ritalin <laughs> hey, somewhere. How about that? <laughs> it was a black but, market guy. Yeah, right? we're, yeah, yeah, you know, I could probably be diagnosed <laughs> for ADHD to be honest with you. Um, uh, but then, but then the one thing that because I'm always looking to opt, how do you optimize your brain? You know what I mean? Like I'm sure, always curious yes. about that. And anything yes. I can do, I know fats help, avocados, you know, cod liver oil. Those things yeah. do help with brain performance, and. Um, and uh, it, it looked to me like people Ritalin was helping people like you know get crap done, uh, but it did mention in there Ritalin doesn't actually help you to be smarter. It just helps you to be more awake, more alert, mm-hmm. work through the night, yeah. like those types yeah. of things. So, but they all have side effects, right? Like yeah. any pharmaceutical is a side effect. So it's just a matter of. I, so I have a friend of mine who's a neurosurgeon, neuroscientist. Uh, he's actually one of the most influential in the city, and he said I asked him about it, and he said this all that stuff is helpful, but you got to look at it like it's going to get you from here to there. Okay. It's the long, when you get on pharmaceuticals long term, there's usually a pretty heavy cost. Yeah. So that was his recommendation was just, eh, just let it get you from here to there, but don't stay. Yeah. That makes sense. Were you, you have toured as kind of the pastor of for King and Country at certain points, yeah. haven't you? Yeah. 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 Those boys are really great. They're very talented. I mean, in the world of Christian music, they are, they're yeah. phenomenal. Yeah, they are. What, um, what do you think were some of the contributors to their success? Theirs, are, theirs is interesting. It's kind of across the board. There are a number of different things that kind of catalyzed uh, for them. If overall, if I plucked a couple of things, it's, first of all, they're, who you see on stage is who they are. So there's an integrity. And by, the, by my definition of integrity is just con, they're congruent with who, who they are, who they say they are and who they are. So there's a congruent piece to that. Um, and... So being genuine and authentic and who they are, that's going to go a thousand miles. Number two, they genuinely love people. Mm. Uh, I've never seen a band. I've traveled with some other bands too. I've, I mean, it blows my mind how long they will sit be uh, afterwards doing doing a meet and greet before. Because I'm like, man, before when I would teach or if I'm speaking at a convention or something, I'm 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 usually pretty locked in. Yes, focused. their ability to. I don't know, we're going to go talk to these eight families before the show. Before the show? Yeah, yeah, before oh, wow. or after. That, it, it kind of blew me away. So they their their willingness to to be with people, to see people, you know, when when you, um, it's not, it looks glamorous because you're there for, you know, a two-hour show. The the day of is not glamorous. You know, you're, you're rolling on the bus, everybody's rolling out of your bunks at, you know, 8 a.m. You get to, you know, you're walking in the, the back of this arena, you're, rolling in sound stages. They might have a shower, hopefully, you know, you're carting out all your soap and stuff. You know, there, there's food. You got to get there on time for it to be warm and all. You know, it looks super glamorous, but it's it's a hard, like you see that road life repetitively is a hard life, yeah. right? So you got to ha- kind of have a, you got to have a certain wiring and they do. It's amazing collectively. And they grew up in a, you know, they grew up in a family doing this. Their older sister is Rebecca St. James. So the boys were young doing that. Their dad managed Rebecca and he's a part of their management team now. And that, to me, David is a huge part of their success as well. Um, and David got, David had a huge loss. He got burned early on. And there's a compassion and kindness to David, which is their dad, um, that, um, I just I deeply admire, mm, and so that explains a lot. Yeah, he, he I didn't he, know that. Yeah, he got burned. At, like, and when they first arrived in the country, they literally lost everything. He was very successful in Australia as a promoter, which is another interesting thing because he knows both sides. So now he's with a band as a manager, and a manager connects in town with the promoter, the person who put the money up front, who's bringing the show in. The promoter's got is it's a big gamble. Will this band? actually sell the tickets will the show go on will nobody get sick will there not be some weird <laughs> pandemic you know yep. like the promoters there's a lot of risk for the promoter well david has often i've heard him and watched him on the road talk to promoters and actually bear some of the risk with them that's unheard of because mm. he was one mm-hmm. so empathy yep he, he knows what that life is like he'd been burned and they're so, so David's, I think a big part of it, but they're hard, hard workers. Joel is one of my dearest friends and Joel is multi-talented and his focus is just <laughs> unreal. I mean, at times I'd be like, you know, afterwards he's, you know, like, let's break down the show. What didn't go right? I'd be like, 
I think this is crack for you. This might not be healthy. Like, yeah. you know, like, you know, just rest for a minute and celebrate. Yeah. But his level of desire for excellence is so off the charts. Anything that has value, it's usually that last 5%, right? You're like, the magic happens in the last 5% of dialing it. It's like working out. You're like, oh, I got mm-hmm. that last rep, but all the magic happens in that those last couple you can't get up. It's the same thing to me when you're creating something. The magic is, you know, everybody does this thing, but those little details, those little things you add to it, and they spend a lot of time on that last 5%. Yeah, I think it's evident. My friend Seth Mosley, I think it was with uh, Full Circle Music, has worked with them yeah. a fair bit. Yeah, and he's, he's, he's men- Yeah, he is great. He has mentioned... Um, they're just great performers. Yeah. It's just really good performers. They're entertainers, man. Yeah. Yeah, yeah they're entertainers. Yeah, yeah absolutely. <laughs>